A vicar returned home for breakfast after taking the eight o'clock service. His wife asked him how many were there for communion. Uh, only three, he said. But when I said with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, I remembered that we were not alone. All Saints reminds us of the ordinary Christian people who have gone before. Not the saints celebrated with particular days or names, but those people who have nurtured you and me in the faith, parents, clergy, youth leaders, friends, Sunday school teachers, all who've kept alive the faith in our churches over the centuries. The great cloud of witnesses who ran with perseverance the race that was set before them. And this year in particular, we want to think of those who we have lost in recent months, whose parting often we've not been able to mark in the way that we would wish. That's been true in my family and many others because of the restrictions that there are. The reading, the gospel reading for this Sunday comes from uh, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes. And I'll read them and then say a few words about them. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. <clears throat> then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. They're uh, strange words, the Beatitudes. We think of someone as blessed if they drive a BMW or <coughs> ski at Zermatt or win the lottery. But Jesus says truly blessed people are those who know what sorrow and suffering mean. Those who are poor and unimpressive, trodden on and yet able to make peace. William Temple uh, once described the world as being like a, a, a shop window with all its goods on display. And things with, that are pretty worthless are given a high price tag and things of true value uh, are rated low. Well, here are some of the qualities that are of the truest value, the highest price. Somebody's written some alternative Beatitudes, uh, today's Beatitudes, if you like. Blessed are the pushers, for they get on in the world. Blessed are the tough, for they never let life hurt them. Blessed are those who complain, for they get what they want. Blessed are the blasé, for they never worry over their sins. Blessed are the slave drivers, they get results. Blessed are the knowledgeable men of the world, they know their way around. Blessed are the troublemakers, for they get their own way in the end. Blessed are the popular, for they never lack friends. There's a great gap between the way that we and society acts and the qualities that Jesus calls blessed. He's not greatly bothered by success or popularity measurable targets. Instead, he looks for mercy and righteousness, peacemaking and integrity. They're the top of his agenda. In other words, about developing a spiritual character. 
And I would suggest two little thoughts that flow from the Beatitudes. One is that God's blessing rests on those who know their need of him. That we come to God, not full of our own achievements and virtues, but empty handed, poor in spirit, not boasting of our successes, but mourning our sins. Because the Christian faith is not so much about what we do, but about what Christ has done. That in his life, death and resurrection, we are restored to God. That uh, Jesus takes on himself the mess that we make of the world so that we can know God for ourselves. Strictly Come Dancing is on on Saturday nights at the moment. My wife's a good fan of it. You know how it is when the couples have danced and then there's an awkward pause. Have they done enough? Uh, can, uh, can they get through to the next round? And some people think that the Christian faith or life is a bit like that. We do our best and then wait to see if we've done enough. But uh, God in Jesus says, no, uh, it is finished. We're accepted just as we are as we put our hand into his. And my second little thought is that the Beatitudes call us to involvement in the world. They call us to be merciful in our dealings with people, to be peacemakers, to use the gentle strength of meekness rather than the force of self-assertion. And only those who are involved in life and in our communities can offer those things. Uh, well, well, amid all the complexities and ambiguities of life, Jesus tells us that you don't have to have worldly success in order to have dignity, that life is more than entertainment, politics more than power, that the spirit is sustained not by pleasures that fade, but by wisdom that grows. The Christian faith speaks of a God who in Jesus is in the arena, involved in all the pain and activity of life and calling us uh, to follow him. And our Christian communities, uh, made up of all the saints of today, are to be marked by that generosity and grace, sacrifice and service that we find supremely in Jesus. And let's pray for ourselves that as we remember the great saints of the past and the humble unknown saints that have uh, proclaimed the Christian faith through the centuries, uh, that we ourselves might walk in that same way and follow in the way that Christ calls us to do.